Are there among the countless stars that illuminate our night sky with a thousand lights, stellar systems identical to ours? Who has never asked himself this question while plunging his glance in the depths of a starry night? To this day, no one is willing to answer this mystery. However, astronomers who have been interested in this question since antiquity have never ceased to track down, observe, and then list each of the stars discovered in the course of their work, even the most insignificant. Although they do not have a reliable answer to share with us concerning the number of stars around us, they are now able to refine their estimates. The latest technological advances, always more powerful, now allow scientists to specify their figures, and these, as you can imagine, are dizzying. Some estimate that there could be more than 200 million trillion of them. To try to provide an answer to this question, but also to better understand the workings of the universe, the European Space Agency launched the Gaia mission in 2013. An astronomy satellite, much more powerful than its predecessor, the Hipparchos satellite, which operated only four years, from 1989 to 1993, has photographed the sky continuously in three dimensions. It was able to measure the position, distance, and movement of a billion stars. Billions of data were collected before being processed by a team led by CNRS researchers. They then achieved an unprecedented feat by creating the first map of our galactic neighborhood. Of course, this map is not exhaustive, and researchers do not doubt that many objects remained in the shadows without being immortalized, either because of lack of brightness or because they are hidden by other stars. Nevertheless, in a radius of only 10 parsecs, that is 32.6 light years around our sun, they counted 540 celestial objects, including 373 stars of different types, as well as 77 exoplanets. This map, in addition to defining the position of the stars, gives us other information, such as the luminosity of the stars, their spectral class, but especially their interaction with other cosmic objects. It turns out that more than half of the stars in our galaxy are M-class stars, i.e. red dwarfs similar to Proxima Centauri, the closest star to our own sun. Some of them seem to be isolated, while others are indeed part of a system. Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we are going to visit the neighboring star systems, from the brightest to the most surprising. Your journey today will take you as close as possible to the stars in the vicinity of our sun. I suggest that you make yourself comfortable in our spacecraft, which will quickly take you to these distant and fascinating lands. But before starting our interstellar journey, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to like the video and to subscribe to the channel so as not to miss anything. Thank you, and have a nice trip! Let's take the opportunity while we are exiting our solar system to make a little retrospective and revisit our classics. To begin with, what is a star system? At first glance, when we are interested in stars, we might think that they are all independent of each other. But this is not the case. If some stars are isolated, evolving without interactions with their distant neighbors, on the other hand, others are linked by gravitational attraction. When a small number of stars thus linked, 
orbit around each other, we speak of a stellar system, each star being a component. It happens that some star systems are falsely named as such, being composed of a single star. It has a planetary system in its orbit. The discovery of these stars also influences their name. We speak of visual or astrometric star systems when they are discovered through their apparent movements in the sky. When they are detected according to the variation of their brightness, they are then called eclipsing star systems. Finally, when they are characterized by their spectrum, they are called spectroscopic star systems. A stellar system of two stars can have different names, such as a binary system, a binary star, or a double star. This is notably the case of Sirius, the most sparkling star in our night sky. Multiple star systems with more than two stars are diverse. A triple, trinary, or ternary star system contains three stars. A quadruple, or quaternary system contains four. We can continue with quintuple, sextuple, septuple systems for respectively five, six, or seven stars, and so on. When a system contains a hundred stars, or even many more, it falls into the category of star clusters, or even galaxies. But let's leave this theoretical part now and let's focus on the closest systems located in our galactic neighborhood. We are approaching the nearest star system to our Sun. This is Proxima Centauri, a stellar and planetary system that also goes by the name of Alpha Centauri C. You'll understand why it's called Alpha Centauri in a moment. We are in the constellation of Centauri, only 4.2 light years from Earth, and therefore still in our beautiful and luminous Milky Way. The luminous object you have before you is a red dwarf. These are very common in our galaxy. They represent nearly 80% of the stars in the Milky Way. The apparent magnitude of Proxima Centauri, which is equal to 11.05, does not place it in the category of the brightest stars, the most radiant stars being of first magnitude. In fact, 85% of the energy it emits is not visible to our eyes, being mainly in the infrared wavelengths. To the naked eye, its luminosity in visible light is almost 650 times less than that of our Sun. Proxima Centauri is therefore of spectral type M5, which explains why it was only discovered in 1915. With an actual diameter of 200,000 kilometers or 125,000 miles, it is seven times smaller than the Sun, which is one and a half times the size of Jupiter the largest planet in our solar system. Its mass is about 12.3% of the Sun's. But Proxima Centauri has a medium density, and its density is much higher than that of the Sun. Unlike our star, which transmits its energy to the outside by radiation, Proxima Centauri transmits it by physical movements of the plasma. The interior of this star is therefore entirely convective. The helium which is produced by nuclear fusion, instead of accumulating in the center of the star, circulates inside it. This results in a convection phenomenon which generates a permanent magnetic field. This magnetic energy is extracted from the object in the form of stellar eruptions comparable to solar flares. Some of these explosions can reach incredible dimensions, corresponding to the size of the star itself, which considerably increases its total luminosity during a certain period of time. Nearly 80% of the star's surface is active, 
which is far beyond the activity that we know of the sun. This is why the temperature of its corona, even outside its peaks of activity, remains higher than that of the sun. It reaches 3.5 million degrees Celsius, or 6.3 million degrees Fahrenheit, while our sun does not exceed 2 million degrees Celsius, or 3.6 million degrees Fahrenheit. This violent activity is nevertheless less important than many other red dwarfs can undergo, probably because of the advanced age of this star, which is estimated at several billion years. Proxima Centauri is a planetary system. The star does not evolve alone, far from it. It is accompanied by not one, but three planets orbiting it. The first, Proxima Centauri b, is a telluric planet located in the habitable zone of its host at a distance of 7 million kilometers. Its orbital period is just over 11 Earth days. Its mass, about 1.3 times that of our Earth, and its equilibrium temperature suggest that there could be water in a liquid state on its surface. But if we assume that this exoplanet has no atmosphere, which has been destroyed by repeated stellar eruptions, no form of life could be found there. The proximity of the two objects probably leads to a synchronous rotation, which means that this planet permanently shows the same face to its star. As a result, Proxima Centauri b could experience very high temperatures on its exposed side, hindering the presence of liquid water, while its hidden side would be extremely cold, covered mostly by ice. But what about the regions located between these two zones? Do you believe, in case of the presence of an atmosphere, that a life is possible at the level of the Terminator? this border connecting the two faces? The second planet that orbits Proxima Centauri is a cold super-Earth of the mini-Neptune type. This is Proxima Centauri c. With a mass of 5.8 times that of the Earth, it is located at about 1.5 astronomical units from its star. Its orbital period is 1900 days, or a little more than five Earth years. Finally, an exoplanet, whose mass is a quarter of that of the Earth, was detached in 2022. It is Proxima Centauri d, an exoplanet distant from its host by only 4 million kilometers or 2.5 million miles. Life on this planet which orbits in only five days, is fatally impossible because of its proximity to the star. Furthermore, Proxima Centauri, although discovered late, was found to belong to an even larger system. In fact, it is only the third and smallest star in a triple system, Alpha Centauri, which has been known for much longer. Do you see, not far from there, these two stars which make you eye? I suggest that we get closer to these two bright stars, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B, which form the main duo in this triple system. They are distant from their third companion by nearly 13,000 astronomical units, or 1,950 billion kilometers or 1,200 billion miles. This distance, which is only 5% of the distance between Alpha Centauri AB and our Sun, still suggests an orbital period of Proxima Centauri between 507,000 and 613,000 years around the main duo. The distance and its low orbital velocity explain why Proxima Centauri has long been excluded from this system, to which it is nevertheless gravitationally bound. To the naked eye, this binary system 
because of the proximity of its components, appears from our Earth as the brightest star in the constellation Centauri and the third brightest in our sky, with Sirius and Canopus surpassing it. Similar to the Sun, the two stars that compose it are respectively of class G2 and K1. Alpha Centauri A, also named Rigel Cantaris, is the largest of the stellar duo, with a mass equivalent to 1.1 solar masses and a luminosity 1.519 times that of the Sun. It is a yellow dwarf that is 10% more massive than the Sun, with a radius 22% larger. In short, you are looking at the twin sister of our Sun, Alpha Centauri b, also called Ptolemyan, is slightly smaller and cooler than its companion. The mass of this secondary star is 90% of that of the Sun, and its diameter only 14%. Its luminosity is barely 45% of that of the Sun. Therefore, it has a main sequence of spectral type K which gives it this more orange color. These two stars orbit each other in 80 years. Their orbits, slightly eccentric, bring them closer to each other by 11.2 astronomical units, or about 1.68 billion kilometers, which is the distance between the Sun and Saturn. When they move away, they can be up to 35.6 astronomical units, or 5.33 billion kilometers, or 3.1 billion miles, which is equivalent to the distance between Pluto and our Sun. Astronomy enthusiasts will have to wait until May 2035 to benefit from the next Paris Center in order to observe this pair in optimal conditions. Their orbital period will then have brought them closer. But our interstellar journey gives you today the possibility to observe them as never before. So let's take advantage of it to know a little more. Do you think that this star system, which is home to stars resembling our sun, could harbor any form of life? And why wouldn't there be, in this not so distant land, some hot and rocky planets with a lot of water, comparable to our Earth? If you look at the near environment of Alpha Centauri A, at first sight, no planet is visible. However, a candidate exoplanet named Candidate 1 has been studied by astronomers since 2021. Distant of about 1.1 astronomical units from the star, with a revolution estimated at one year, it could in fact be only a dust disk or even an artifact. On the other hand, Alpha Centauri b could have several companions, even if they have not been confirmed by the scientific community. The first, detected in 2012, would be a planet whose mass, greater than 1.1 and 2.7 times that of the Earth, qualifies it as a super-Earth. It is called Alpha Centauri bb, or Gliese 559 bb. Only this candidate orbits in a non-habitable zone with respect to its host star on a short period of 3.24 days. Distant from 0.04 astronomical units or only 6 million kilometers or 3.7 million miles from its star, you can imagine that no life can develop there. The very high temperatures of this planet would be able to melt lead. But recent studies have shown that Alpha Centauri BB is actually a statistical ghost. It has therefore disappeared from the list of exoplanets. The second companion, Alpha Centauri BC, is another candidate planet that seems to evolve little further than the previous one, with an orbital period of less than 20 days 
Its size, 92% that of the Earth, would have made it an ideal telluric planet. But once again, its proximity to the star that hosts it makes the presence of water in a liquid state on its surface impossible. At present, it is finally near the smallest star of this triple system, Proxima Centauri, that we are most likely to discover a habitable planet, at least in part. But let's see what the next solar systems can tell us. Although more distant, they could hold some nice surprises. Let's start with Barnard's star, which is located a little further away in the constellation of Ophiuchus, 5.9 light years from our Sun. Despite its proximity to our solar system, its low luminosity prevents its observation without a telescope. Indeed, it is a red dwarf of spectral type M4. In other words, it is an old lady. Of an advanced age of some 10 billion years, it presents a deficiency in metal. It contains barely 25% of the amount contained by the Sun. Moreover, it has lost a lot of its rotation energy. This one is 130 days, which is relatively slow compared to the one of the Sun, which makes it in 25 days only. Much less radiant than our Sun, it is hardly more luminous than 100 full moons cumulated. Its mass represents 17% of solar mass, and its radius 15 to 20% of the Sun's. However, this star monopolizes the sphere of scientists for various reasons. Under its calm airs, it can still show strong fits of anger resulting in significant stellar activity. Moreover, in 1998, an intense stellar flare was observed. The temperature reached during this eruption exceeded 7,700 degrees Celsius, or 13,800 degrees Fahrenheit, more than double the temperature of the star. Barnard's star is therefore a so-called eruptive star. In addition, it is sometimes called the runaway star of Barnard. If the stars appear as fixed points in our night sky, they all move in our universe. But these movements, when compared to the scale of our human lifetimes, seem insignificant. However, Barnard's star holds a speed record. It is the fastest moving star in our Earth's sky, not following the general flow of stars around our Milky Way. To give you an idea, this star moves across our sky about one full moon width over a period of 174 years. This may seem extremely slow to you, but compared to other stars, Barnard's star feels like it is spinning through the sky with a relative lateral speed, that is, sideways to our sun, of 90 kilometers per second, or 55 miles per second. Its radial velocity brings it closer to our solar system at the crazy speed of 140 kilometers per second, or 85 miles per second. By the year 11,800 AD, Barnard's star should be only 3.8 light years away from our Earth. You are probably wondering why we are visiting Barnard's star. Why are we interested in this isolated star that doesn't seem to belong to a system? In fact, Barnard's star is a small planetary system. This star, which has monopolized planet hunters for several decades, has been the subject of more than 770 observations. Astronomers saw their efforts rewarded in 2018. An exoplanet does orbit near Barnard's star. It is Barnard's star B, 
also known as the planet Barnard B. This rocky planet has a mass equivalent to 3.2 times that of Earth, making it a super-Earth. Distant from about 60 million kilometers or 37 million miles, twice as close to its host as the Earth is to the Sun, it revolves in 233 days. But this close distance is not enough to place it in the habitable zone of this red dwarf. The exoplanet Barnard B, compared to our Earth, receives only 2% of the energy of its star. It evolves just beyond what is called the ice line. Its surface temperature is so cold approximately minus 170 degrees Celsius, or minus 274 degrees Fahrenheit, that the presence of liquid water is highly unlikely. This planet cannot support any form of life. Too bad. This discovery, which is the result of an important collaboration between many scientists from all over the world, follows 20 years of studies performed with seven different instruments. However, other candidate planets are being studied in this stellar region, including Barnard Star C and Barnard Star D. But so far, no study has been able to confirm their presence. Astronomers now know that they are likely to discover many other planets of this type near red dwarfs, especially as technologies continue to progress. The only thing left to do now is to find an exoplanet that has the right conditions to support life. Let's continue our interstellar journey and reach the binary system Lumen 16, which is only 6.5 light years away from our Sun. Composed of two brown dwarfs, it is located in the southern constellation of the Sails. To date, it is the closest known pair of brown dwarfs to our solar system. Their recent discovery, which dates back only to 2013, was the result of a 13-month mission by NASA's WISE spacecraft. It acquired about 1.8 million images of asteroids, stars, and galaxies. But first, what is a brown dwarf? In reality, it is an object too massive to be considered a gas giant, but not massive enough to be a star, being unable to trigger nuclear fusion at its center. Brown dwarfs are sometimes compared to failed stars. The main component of this binary system is of spectral type L8. The second, even less bright, is also a late bloomer that appears closer to the transition threshold. These two objects, which are separated by more than three astronomical units, orbit each other in about 25 years. This slowness is explained by their low mass, although it represents about 30 times that of Jupiter. Like Jupiter, the two brown dwarfs are subject to strong winds, as evidenced by the bright stripes running parallel to their respective equators. If you take a closer look at Object B, you will see a complex structure of irregular clouds on its surface, sometimes light, sometimes dark. Composed of iron droplets and other minerals, these disparate clouds present extreme weather conditions, with temperatures exceeding 1,000 degrees Celsius or 1,832 degrees Fahrenheit. But let's be careful and keep our distance from this molten iron rain. Because of their low luminosity, these two red dwarfs offer scientists an open-air laboratory that should allow them to study this type of object more easily. Brown dwarfs could reveal the secrets that govern planetary evolution, but also the formation of stars. They could even allow the discovery of exoplanets. While brown dwarfs are not massive enough to allow hydrogen fusion like stars do, they do cool slowly as they contract 
and their surface gravity increases. As a result, the surface temperature of a brown dwarf can vary considerably. It can reach degrees almost comparable to those of a star, and on the contrary, degrees as low as those of a cold planet. Their age and their physical composition are as many parameters that make them different from each other. They can then present great diversity of colors and spectral characteristics. Slight perturbations are observable in the orbits of these two brown dwarfs. A planet is probably at the origin of these variations. But to find this unconfirmed object, we must know on which side to look, and at what distance. Because as we have already seen, even at very large distances from each other, objects can be linked. Let's go now to the constellation of Hydra to discover the star Y0855-0714. This star is 7.2 light years away from our sun. This short distance on the cosmic scale makes it the fourth closest star to our sun. Its physical characteristics place it in the category of sub-brown dwarfs, or brown dwarfs of planetary mass, its mass corresponding to 1% of the solar mass. Its formation, identical to that of stars or brown dwarfs, is the result of the collapse of a gas cloud. Only its mass, which is 10 masses of Jupiter, remains lower than the 13 masses allowing it to generate the thermonuclear fusion of deuterium, so that it can claim the status of star. If this type of object is often classified in the category of brown dwarfs of planetary mass, some scientists consider them as planets floating freely in the cosmos. Y0855-0714 is even cataloged by some as a rogue planet, especially since it seems to evolve alone, without any companion at its side. Its discovery, made possible by WISE, NASA's Wide Field Infrared Explorer, dates back to 2014. This star, whose radius is slightly smaller than Jupiter's, has average temperatures worthy of the North Pole from about minus 48 degrees Celsius to minus 13 degrees Celsius, or between minus 54 degrees Fahrenheit and 9 degrees Fahrenheit. Colder than Earth's average temperatures, but warmer than those on the surface of Jupiter. Therefore, among all its fellows in interstellar space, it is the coldest object of all. But this is not what surprised astronomers the most when they observed it. Let's get a little closer to this failing star. Its spectral type Y allows us to observe its surface more closely, without the need to protect our eyes. We can admire in an atmosphere tinted with azure shades, clouds similar to those surrounding our beautiful blue planet. Isn't it extraordinary? These clouds are composed of water ice crystals and sodium sulfide. This is a first for scientists. If water vapor has already been detected in the atmospheres of exoplanets, this is the first time that water clouds are observed outside our solar system. Even at the closest to our planet, these observations are generally only possible on Earth or Mars. The giant planets are so cold that the ammonia ice clouds mask the water clouds, as on Jupiter and Saturn, and the atmospheres of Neptune and Uranus prevent any visibility. All in all, this so-called failing star is of great interest to the scientific community especially since it evolves alone in interstellar space. As you have probably noticed, no other object seems to be gravitationally linked to this failed star. Observations looking at it, therefore, cannot be subject to interference from a nearby star that could cause any glare.
Let's now turn our attention to another star system, also located a short distance from our solar system. Let's go to the constellation Leo, where a red dwarf has, like our sun, a corona. Here we are approaching Wolf 359, a star that is certainly quite pale, with a spectral type of class M6.5, but which hosts two exoplanets. They are respectively named Wolf 359b and Wolf 359c. Wolf 359 is one of the smallest stars known to date, its mass of 0.09 solar masses being at the lower limit. Indeed, a star whose mass is lower than 0.08 solar mass is not massive enough to ignite the hydrogen of its core. Wolf 359 is then at the limit to be considered also as a brown dwarf. Because of its small size, its radius being only 0.16 solar radius, it is entirely convective. The helium produced in its center arrives at its surface thanks to the movement of the plasma. Because of this weak and slow production of energy, it will probably remain in this state much longer than our sun, which burns its cartridges at high speed. The life of the latter is estimated at 10 billion years, and we know that it has reached 4.55 billion years. In place of our sun, the faintness of Wolf 359 would represent about 10 times the brightness of our full moon. Not enough to cause us the slightest sunburn, even worse, not enough to hope for any presence of life on our planet, which would then be covered with ice. However, this young spinner, at least 100 million years old, and whose projected rotation speed is less than 3 kilometers per second, or 2 miles per second, is a flare star, in other words, a variable star. Of UV SETI type, it undergoes sometimes brutal increases of its luminosity on all its spectrum. Its magnetic activity induces brief eruptions which can occur at a rate of 32 events over a period of two hours, most of them being micro-eruptions. Its surface temperature, much lower than that of our sun, is nevertheless 2500 degrees Celsius or 4532 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature is low enough for the chemical compounds to remain long enough to be observed with their spectral lines. In 2001, molecular lines composed of carbon monoxide, iron hydride, chromium hydride, water, magnesium hydride, vanadium oxide, or titanium oxide could be observed for the first time from a terrestrial telescope. Apart from the Sun, Wolf 359 is therefore the first star to expose the spectrum of its corona to the light. The study of its spectrum revealed the absence of lithium lines. This element has probably been entirely consumed by fusion in the core. This is the parameter that allows us to conclude that this star must be at least 100 million years old. As we have seen, Wolf 359 is not alone. It has two companions. Two planets orbit around it. The first, Wolf 359b, is 276 million kilometers, or 170 million miles away. And the second, Wolf 359c, is close to 2.7 million kilometers, or 1.7 million miles. The more distant of the two has a mass of about 43.9 Earth masses and orbits Wolf 359 over a period of 2,938 days. The closer one, Wolf 359c, is much less massive with its 3.8 Earth masses. It orbits its star in 2.7 days. Unfortunately, these two planets are either too far away or too close to their host to be located in the habitable zone, 
which extends from 3.6 and 7.7 .7 million kilometers away, or between 2.2 and 4.7 million miles. Wolf 359b would be so cold that it could only be covered by a thick coat of ice, while its companion, Wolf 359c, would suffer from temperatures too high for water to remain in liquid state on its surface. Our efforts to find a potentially habitable exoplanet will therefore have to focus on another star system. Another red dwarf located in the Big Dipper constellation and 8.3 light years away from our sun is particularly promising. Let's join the second Argelander star, better known as Gliese 411, or Lalanne 21185, an old lady between 5 and 10 billion years old. This red dwarf of type MV5 is cold and dark. Its luminosity, which is 6,000 times lower than that of our sun, does not prevent it, however, from being among the brightest red dwarfs in the solar neighborhood. Its apparent magnitude is only 7.47, so it cannot be observed with the naked eye. It has all the characteristics of a half-sun, a mass of about 46% of solar mass, and a diameter equivalent to 40% of that of the sun. If its mass had reached 50% of solar mass, it would probably have entered the category of red giants. Its surface temperature, which is about 3,328 degrees Celsius, or 6,022 degrees Fahrenheit, or 62% of that of the sun, can undergo sudden variations as well as its luminosity. Indeed, Gliese 411 is a so-called eruptive star, a flare. The eruptions on its surface are as unpredictable as they are spectacular, especially since the excess luminosity produced contrasts with the usual pallor of the star. At first sight, apart from its spectral anger, this star has nothing extraordinary. However, it integrates the list of interesting objects for exoplanet hunters. On the one hand, because of its proximity to our Earth, and on the other hand, because of its constant radial velocity. It is a perfect example of the stability level of red dwarfs, although it moves perpendicular to the galactic plane at high speed, with an average of 47 kilometers per second, or 30 miles per second. In its interstellar course, Gliese 411 undergoes, however, astrometric perturbations. The study of these variations has established that this red dwarf is indeed part of a multiple system. Since 1996, it is known that not one, but two, or even potentially three planets are in orbit around Gliese 411, which is therefore the fourth closest planetary system to our Sun after Alpha Centauri, Barnard's star, and Wolf 359. The first planet is called Gliese 411b. It is a super-Earth. Its mass corresponds to three Earth masses. Very close to its star, at 0.08 times the distance Earth to Sun, it completes its orbital period, which is very circular, in only 13 days. Gliese 411b is five times closer to its host than Mercury is to the Sun, and although this star is less hot than the Sun, the planet is not in the habitable zone. It receives 3.5 times more energy than the Earth receives from the Sun, and must therefore have strong similarities with Venus. A second planet evolves at a little less than three astronomical units from the mother star. This is Gliese 411c. This exoplanet, whose mass exceeds 13 terrestrial masses, 
covers its orbit in 2,946 days. It is therefore a Neptune-like planet located well beyond the habitable zone. Finally, a third planet could also interfere with the main star, placing it in the category of quadruple systems. Named Gliese 411d, it is 0.5 astronomical units away from its host. With a mass equivalent to four Earth masses, it has an orbital period of 215 days. It remains to be seen if its temperature and atmosphere are suitable or not for any form of life. What about you? What do you think about it? But let's leave this question aside for the moment. A star sparkling like no other attracts your attention, and for good reason. You are looking at Sirius, the brightest star after the sun in our winter sky. You know, the one that flashes in the sky, reminding you of the intermittent lights of a plane at high altitude. Moreover, its name, which was not chosen at random, means bright in Greek. We find traces of its sparkling presence since the dawn of time. For the ancient Egyptians, the Nile star, as they called it, announced the periods of flooding of the river. In Chinese astronomy, it was called the Celestial Wolf, while the Greeks associated it with the Dog of Orion, then called Sirius. This star also played a fundamental role for Polynesian navigators by serving as a landmark. The stars were their only reliable tool for orientation at sea, and Sirius, easily recognizable, marked the zenith of the most honored place of worship in the entire Polynesian region. It is located in the constellation of the Great Dog at a distance of 8.6 light years from our own system. That is why it is also known as Alpha Canis Majoris, being the brightest star in this constellation. Its apparent magnitude is minus 1.46. To be clear, this negative number means that Sirius is brighter than our Sun, a magnitude of one being equivalent to the solar luminosity. This is why, despite a distant, but at the same time so close to our solar system on the scale of the cosmos, Sirius, which is classified in the category of white stars, appears so bright. Its brightness is punctuated by variation when observed from Earth. As you can see, however, it does not blink any more than our sun. This effect is due to the fact that Sirius is located very low on our Earth's horizon. The light emitted by the star must therefore cross a large part of the atmosphere before reaching us. It is therefore more or less masked by the turbulence of the environment that separates us from it, hence its flickering. During our approach, if you look carefully at Sirius, you see that it is in fact a binary star. It is composed of two stars. The main one, Sirius A, is a white, slightly bluish star of spectral type A0 or A1. More luminous than our own star, it is 2.3 times more massive and 1.8 times larger than our Sun. I let you imagine the heat that reigns on its surface, its temperature being higher than 9600 degrees Celsius or 17,300 degrees Fahrenheit. That is to say, much more than our sun, which burns at 5,504 degrees Celsius or 9,930 degrees Fahrenheit. All these characteristics evoke the relatively young age of Sirius which should not have more than 200, even 250 million years. It has for companion a white dwarf named Sirius B. The latter, because of its small size, its proximity to Sirius A and its low magnitude of only eight was discovered only very late in 1862. As a white dwarf, Sirius B has a size comparable to that of the Earth 
while its mass is equivalent to that of the Sun, and its estimated temperatures are three times higher than those of Sirius A. Separated from the main star by an average of 19.5 astronomical units, or 19.5 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, it orbits around it over a period of 50 years. Because of a strongly marked elliptical orbit, the distance between these two stars can vary from 8.1 to 31.5 astronomical units. This maximum distance will soon be reached by 2024 to 2025, while the next passage at the periastron of the system, i.e. the moment when the two stars will be the closest, is planned for 2044. This binary system is waving alone in the cosmos. No planet has yet been seen in its vicinity. Sirius being a young star, it is unlikely that exoplanets are in orbit around it. However, since 2018, NASA has been exploring this bright object with the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And who knows, its high brightness could mask one or even several planetary objects. At almost the same distance from our Sun, another stellar duo awaits us. Let's join, at 8.7 light years from our solar system, Leuton 726-8, a binary system hosting two stars, BL SETI and UV SETI. They are once again two M-type red dwarfs, probably younger than our solar system. With a low luminosity, they are not visible to the naked eye. This is why they were only discovered in 1948. These two stars, like twin sisters, have many similarities. Both have almost identical masses, radii and luminosities. Their mass is 10% of the solar mass, their radius 14%, and their combined luminosity is 11,000 times less than that of the Sun. It is therefore not surprising that we detect an identical temperature on the surface of these two stars, which is close to 2,330 degrees Celsius, or 4,220 degrees Fahrenheit. If the two stars orbit around a common barycenter over a period of 26.5 years, their orbits are marked by a strong eccentricity. The distance between them can therefore vary between 2.1 and 8.8 .8 astronomical units, causing strong tidal forces between the two objects. BL SETI the main component of this duo has a luminosity 6,000 times lower than the Sun, while the secondary star, UV SETI, has a luminosity 4,000 times lower. UV SETI is the better known of the two. The latter rotates very fast, with a rotation of only 0.2 days. Its rotation speed feeds a powerful magnetic field, where bubbles charged with matter by the convection currents typical of red dwarfs trigger important eruptions. UV SETI is therefore a flaming star. During one of its numerous eruptions, its luminosity can be multiplied by 100 in a few seconds. At the same time, massive emissions of UV and X-rays ignite the star's environment. In 1952, the observation of UV SETI allowed to count not less than 75 variations of its luminosity in only 20 seconds. This particularity places it in the category of variable stars, where moreover it serves as a reference. Indeed, other eruptive stars are sometimes included in the category of UV SETI variables. The main star is less active. This is probably related to the fact that it has a lower rotation speed. 
Nevertheless, the motions of these two stars are at the origin of unusual stellar winds. Their surfaces are subjected to winds more violent than those experienced by the Sun, although weaker at equivalent distances. The resulting heliosphere extends to 10 or 20 astronomical units. During massive eruptions, this heliosphere can be expelled up to 100 astronomical units. When the eruption of one of the two stars is directed towards the second, a shock zone is created, somewhere between the two stars, giving a complex and non-spherical shape to the heliosphere surrounding UV SETI. In short, the environment near this star system does not seem to be the most favorable to host a planet in the best conditions. This one, in addition to being subjected to stellar winds, would inexorably undergo the unpredictable explosions of anger of UV SETI. However, Oscillations have been noticed in the orbits of the two stars, in particular, that of BL SETI. But what could a planet located in this tiny part of space look like? A hypothetical planet orbiting UV SETI would have no atmosphere, as it would be deteriorated in a few millennia by repeated flares. On the other hand, a planet orbiting BL SETI could keep its atmosphere for more than a hundred thousand years. However, the important forces of tide undergone would dress this planet of a multitude of volcanoes where the only existing rivers would welcome only the flows of a burning lava. Moreover, the strong fluctuations of temperatures would have reason of the rock present on its surface, transforming it gradually into dust, which would mix with the volcanic ashes. A planet in orbit around these two stars would be more than 30 astronomical units away. Of course, it could contain its atmosphere, but its temperatures below minus 230 degrees Celsius or minus 382 degrees Fahrenheit would not be very attractive, and the luminosity on this planet would be null, except during strong stellar eruptions. In short, if the binary system Leuton 726-8 can be attractive by its spectacular side, it is not very welcoming. Ross 154 is the ninth closest star system to our Sun. Located in the constellation of Sagittarius, it is 9.7 light years away. Composed of a main sequence star of spectral class M3.5V, it is not visible to the naked eye from our Earth. Ross 154 is therefore by definition a red dwarf star, cold and dark. Its discovery by Frank Elmore Ross dates back to 1925. Ross 154, also named Gliese 729, has a mass equivalent to 17% of solar mass. Its size is about 20% of the Sun. Its apparent magnitude is only 10.44. The luminosity of this star is relatively low and represents only 0.4% of the Sun. Ross 154 is so small that it is not able to expel heat from the core at its surface, as do the larger red dwarfs. So it carries this heat to its surface by convection. Moreover, as you can imagine, the heat at its surface is much lower than that of our Sun. It is estimated at 3,019 degrees Celsius, or 5,460 degrees Fahrenheit. However, this star is not so ordinary. Like many red dwarves, it is an eruptive star. Moreover, it integrates the category of UV SETI type variables. This flare star, during prodigious eruptions, can thus generate X-ray emissions 
comparable to, or even superior to, those of the Sun. In addition, to integrate the catalog of eruptive stars, Ross 154 is also part of the variable stars of type B-Y Draconis because of its variations of 0.03 magnitude, noted on a period of 2.87 days. In addition, its relatively low metallicity, estimated at 56% of that of the Sun, as well as its moderately high rotation speed of 3.5 kilometers per second, or 4 miles per second, allow to conclude that it is a relatively young star. Ross 154 is less than a billion years old. No planet has been detected in its environment. In any case, as for a large part of red dwarf stars, the numerous and violent eruptions which burst out at its surface would fatally harm any form of life which could develop in its habitable zone, the planet having necessarily to be close to the star. In the constellation of Andromeda, another red dwarf has almost the same characteristics. It is Ross 248, also known as Gliese 905. Located at 10.3 light years from our solar system, it is similarly a flaming star that sometimes increases its brightness suddenly. Its mass is about 12% of the solar mass, its diameter is 7%, and its luminosity is 11,000 times lower than the Sun's. Periods of variability have been reported, ranging from 4.2 years to 120 days, and five others between 60 and 291 days. What if these were astrometric disturbances that could be attributed to the presence of an invisible companion? For the moment, no planet or other object has been found orbiting this star. In any case, the meteorological vagaries of this star can only harm any form of life in its proximal periphery, if it could have developed at all, especially since its reddish color would prevent any form of terrestrial-type plant life from properly carrying out its photosynthesis process. Another star system is of great interest to the scientific community. It is an orange dwarf star that plays hide-and-seek. Let's go to discover this mysterious star in the constellation of Eridanus, 10.5 light-years from our solar system. This is Epsilon Eridani, also known as Ran. Its apparent magnitude of 3.73 makes it the third closest individual star system visible to the naked eye. Younger than our Sun, it is between 200 and 800 million years old. Being a main sequence star of spectral class K2, the energy generated in its entrails by the nuclear fusion of hydrogen is diffused at its surface, where the temperature is higher than 4800 degrees Celsius or 8,670 degrees Fahrenheit. This is what gives it its beautiful orange color. Slightly smaller than our Sun, its mass is 82% of the solar mass, and its radius is 74% of the Sun's. Its average period of rotation is 11.2 days. Epsilon Iridani is thus more than twice less fast than the Sun. If its luminosity is only equivalent to 34% of the Sun's, on the other hand, it generates a level of magnetic activity higher than that of the Sun. The chromosphere and the corona that surround it are therefore much more dynamic. As a proof, the average intensity of the magnetic field at its surface is 40 times higher than that of the Sun, and its stellar winds 30 times more violent. 
but this activity is not regular at its surface. Some regions are much more active than others. Epsilon Iridani is therefore considered as a variable, B.Y. Draconis. It is a star that has a disconcerting behavior. Sometimes it brightens, sometimes it darkens. It has cycles of 27 years during which its brightness decreases considerably over a period of about two years. This decrease in intensity was last seen from 2009 to 2011. What gigantic object could shadow this star so much? It is known that Epsilon is surrounded by not one, but two rocky asteroid belts. One, three astronomical units away from the star, the second, 20 astronomical units away. However, they cannot explain this particularity. In fact, Epsilon is a binary star with eclipses. This means that it is accompanied by a dark object, probably a star, or even a pair of stars, surrounded by a disk of dust, dense and thick enough to make it invisible. These two stars are probably 30 astronomical units apart, and the diameter of the ring surrounding this pseudo-dark star must reach 20 astronomical units, occulting the main component like a curtain. However, Epsilon still reserves us a surprise in addition to these variations of light, a study over 20 years of its radial speed has highlighted periodic variations. This observation has allowed to highlight the presence of a giant planet of the size of Jupiter in orbit around the star. This planet, named Epsilon Iridani b, or A.E. Jir, follows a slightly eccentric elliptical orbit. Its semi-major axis is equivalent to the distance between our Sun and the asteroid belt. The size of this gas giant is estimated between 80 and 160 percent of the size of Jupiter. It completes its orbit in seven years. If a planet could have formed in this environment, it is probably not alone, especially since the observed dust cloud has an asymmetry that could be explained by the presence of a second planet. This one would then be located much further away than the first one and would have a much longer orbital period. I now propose you to join another red dwarf. Yes, another one. Remember, red dwarfs alone account for about 80 to 85% of the stellar population in our galaxy. But this star should be of great interest to you, as it is considered by the scientific community as the best star to search for potentially habitable exoplanets. Let's discover Gliese 887, also known as Lacale 9352. It takes the 12th place in the list of stellar systems closest to the Sun. Located in the constellation, of southern Pisces, 10.7 light years from our Earth, it appears to be the brightest red dwarf in our sky and requires only a small telescope to be observed. Its luminosity is about 1% of that of the Sun. It is also the most massive of all red dwarfs, with nearly half a solar mass at a distance of six parsecs from the Sun or a little less than 20 light years. But what makes this star even more exceptional is its low photometric variability, which makes it a quiet red dwarf like no other. Unlike its companions, Gliese 887 is less magnetically active and does not seem to ignite by triggering huge explosions or stellar eruptions. In other words, if there are planets orbiting in its narrow habitable zone, we could well detect traces of life there, and even, why not, consider terraforming them when technology allows it. This is very good news. On the one hand, the inactivity of this star 
greatly facilitates the remote observation of any exoplanetary atmosphere. On the other hand, exoplanets orbiting Gliese 887, which have not undergone many energetic explosions, may have retained their original atmosphere. What if I were to reveal to you that at least two exoplanets have been identified near this star? The first, Gliese 887b, is a super-Earth of about four Earth masses. It orbits its star in 9.3 days. Unfortunately, the small distance between it and its host, a little over 10 million kilometers, or 6.2 million miles, means that the temperature is far too high for water to be present in a liquid state. The second, Gliese 887c, is also a super-Earth, whose mass is estimated at seven times that of the Earth. It orbits the star in 21.8 days. Do not rejoice too quickly, because unfortunately, for it too, the conditions are not optimal for it to harbor any form of life. Although a little further away from the star than the first described super-Earth, it is only 17 million kilometers or 11 million miles away. Once again, it is too close and therefore too hot to maintain water in a liquid state, the temperature of its atmosphere having to reach at least 70 degrees Celsius or 158 degrees Fahrenheit. However, any hope of finding an exoplanet in the habitable zone of Gliese 887 is not abandoned. Moreover, a candidate planet has been located in the habitable zone of this planetary system. Named Gliese 887d, this super-Earth of eight Earth masses orbits its star in 50 days. Contrary to the two previous planets, it could therefore experience temperate temperatures and could therefore be well suited to the development of life. Another planetary system, also a little less than 11 light years away, is located in the zodiacal constellation of Virgo. Let us now approach Ross 128, also named Gliese 447 the 13th closest star system to our Sun. This star has an apparent magnitude of 11.13. Its luminosity is therefore 100 times too low to be observed with a naked eye from our Earth. The primary object of the system is once again a red dwarf. Its mass is 15% of the solar mass and its radius 21% of the suns. The temperature of its stellar atmosphere is 2900 degrees Celsius or 5252 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of the energy radiated by the star is visible only in the infrared with a luminosity 33,000 times lower than that of the sun. As a result, it is of spectral type M4V hence its typical cold orange-red color. Twice as old as our sun, this star has been shining for over 9.4 billion years. Despite an entirely convective activity and a rotation speed considered slow, this flare star seems to have a long-term stellar activity cycle. As mentioned earlier, Ross 128 is part of a system it hosts an exoplanet. This one, probably Telluric, orbits in the interior edge of the zone of habitability and thus receives approximately 38% more sunlight than the Earth. The planet Ross 128b is therefore potentially habitable. It is, after Proxima Centauri b, the second closest exoplanet to our solar system to enter this coveted category of cosmic objects. Let's see what this satellite looks like. Slightly more massive than Proxima Centauri b, Ross 128b 
contains at least 1.35 times the mass of the Earth. According to its hypothetical composition, if it is composed only of pure iron, it could have a diameter equivalent to half that of our Earth. According to the opposite hypothesis, if it is only composed of hydrogen and helium, it could then measure three times the size of the Earth. But considering that this planet could be telluric, its radius could be 1.1 times the Earth's radius, or about 7,000 kilometers or 4,350 miles, and its mass would then be 35% more massive than that of the Earth. Depending on its atmospheric component, its surface temperature could even be approximately the same as that of our Earth. Assuming that all these parameters are green, what about those related to the orbit of this planet? Ross 128b orbits rapidly around its star in only 9.9 .9 Earth days. This orbit is quite circular, thus having an eccentricity of only 0.036. It is more than 20 times closer to its host than the Earth is to the Sun, at a distance of 7.4 million kilometers, or 4.6 million miles. This proximity suggests that the planet has a gravity barely greater than that which we experience on Earth. But above all, it must always present the same face to its host. Apart from this particularity, this exoplanet is the only one known to date to resemble so closely our beautiful blue planet. But we must not lose sight of the fact that red dwarfs can be angry. Although the Olympian calm star Ross 128 seems to behave peacefully, it could have eroded the atmosphere surrounding the planet, evolving next to it in the past, during massive and repeated eruptions. But if this is not the case, if this star has always been peaceful, then Ross 128b could well be enveloped by an atmosphere. Why not? Welcome it. We could even go so far as to consider that it could already be home to one or more extraterrestrial life forms. Our interstellar journey is coming to an end. It has taken you almost 11 light years from our sun. You have been able to approach the star systems closest to our Earth. In this infinitely large space, an invaluable quantity of other systems remains to be discovered. Among those already listed, some are located at a short distance. Others, on the other hand, are several million light years away. If for the majority of them, many similarities can be noted, for others, one can distinguish an unusual composition. This is particularly the case for a system that is 150 light years away from our galaxy. The system HD 98800, or TV Craterus, this one consists of two pairs of stars, distant from each other by 150 million kilometers or 93 million miles. I let you imagine what our sky would look like with four suns. But what makes it even more spectacular is the disk of dust that surrounds one of these two pairs. Another system, well known to all, also presents singular characteristics. It is Alpha Ursae Minoris, more often called Polaris. You know this star well under its common name of Polaris, easily spotted near the North Celestial Pole. It is the brightest star in the Little Dipper constellation. It is 431 light years away from our Sun. But did you know that this star is in fact a multiple star? Polaris, which is a supergiant Cepheid variable, has in fact two smaller companions. It is thus a triple system. It has also been found two other components, even more distant.
In the more or less distant future, future generations may be able to explore these even more distant star systems where planets have already been found. This is notably the case for the TRAPPIST-1 system, located 40 light years away. No less than seven telluric exoplanets of the size of the Earth have been discovered there. Three of them are in the habitable zone of the star. The observation of HR 8799, a star 135 light years away, has also revealed another planetary system. Four gas giants, five to ten times the mass of Jupiter, orbit this star. But another system is in the sight of scientists. It is Kepler-22. Located in the constellation Cygnus, 638 light years from our Sun, a G5 main sequence star hosts an exoplanet named Kepler-22b. This exoplanet twice the size of the Earth, orbits not only in the habitable zone of its host, but at a distance that provides a suitable climate for the water on its surface to remain in a liquid state. Back on our beautiful Earth, you can only become aware of the priceless treasure it offers us. The presence of life on a planet as we know it depends on so many parameters that it can finally seem like a miracle. However, the abysmal quantity of stars that populate the cosmos is enough to make us wonder. After all, if a solar system such as ours could be formed, why wouldn't there be others? Statistically, this simple theory is not far-fetched. This is what drives the astronomical community, always in search of new elements to understand the celestial mechanisms, technological advances which open the doors to future discoveries will perhaps one day allow us to get to know new worlds. If so, how do you imagine?